All right, Scott. Uh, welcome to my home here in Boca Thank Raton. You. We we go way back. I can't remember how Quite far back we go. Right? Yes, we have been around a while. But I gravitated to you because your notoriety was based on the sharks up on the beaches. How how long have you been in business up there guiding? I started guiding in Palm Beach in ninety one. Right. I can't think how many how long ago twenty years ago I found you. Oh, at least yeah. But it took me a while to get you to come up and try those things. You were like, ah, it's just a shark. It's like, <laughs> no, they're not just a shark. I think it took a good four or five years for me to get you to actually come up and try those and things. Then, and then you couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> How did you um, get into this whole fly only when you were basically kind of like a light tackle boat, Rex, you know, the type of fish that you chase? Most of the guys that do what you do basically chum they do it all but not fly only how did you gravitate or dive into fly only initially well i just thought it was a simplification that i would have multiple people come interested in the fly and the spinning gear was just getting in the way it really was it wasn't getting used there were rods all over the place and it was just a, a natural progression to just keep weeding out stuff that we weren't using and I decided the fly only was just going to make things a whole lot simpler. Really, the you know the effectiveness isn't isn't downgraded. I believe it in even the least little bit by being fly only. If I, uh, you know, have uh, some ideas on how to work with people that can't cast very well, you know, using teasers, using chum, using sinking lines is a wonderful thing. They can do that all on their own, um, and they. Uh, it just made things really pretty simple and you know really effective. I'm normally targeting anywhere between thirty and forty species a year. Right. And uh, well, let's go to your website here. You know, you say here, you know, right off the bat, um, this is about finding the biggest, meanest, fastest fish available, getting them to destroy a fly and pull you all over the ocean. Sailfish. Dolphin, wahoo, and tuna, very much non-typical uh, fly rod targets. This is not about trout. Right. What do you have about trout? What, what's, what do you have against trout? I don't have anything against trout. <laughs> They're just not I out would, there swimming. I would like my heart rate to increase at some point during the day. <laughs> but obviously you like to target toothy critters. Well, not necessarily toothy, but, you know, big, strong game fish. Right. Um. I don't have anything against trout at all. I cut my eyes on trout guiding up in Western Maine in nineteen seventy yeah. whatever. Yeah, I just I don't even, I don't even I'm scared to even think about how long ago that was. But a uh, um, maybe it's a selfish thing because my entertainment, so the entertainment supplied to me by guys that have just hooked their first tuna or first big jack is I think pretty high. I get a. I get probably as big a kick or a bigger kick out of watching these guys completely panicked and 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 losing their you know losing their game yes. pretty much on something that they had no idea the speed and the power you know is just you know I I find it hugely entertaining. I think we've all been there. I mean the power thrust of a tail of a saltwater fish. There's nothing is that prepares you. Right. There, absolutely nothing that prepares you for that that first big fast king mackerel or False albacore, blackfin tuna. I had, had a guy today on a you know, dolphin mahi mahi for the first time. They, and they were all little, but we were using a five weight, and they were twenty to twenty five inch fish. And uh, the guy was just blown away. You know, it's um, the ocean is a very big place, and when I first got down here, you know, it's just like overwhelming as to you know the spectrum that you have available. But as an angler, you don't really understand until you get with somebody like yourself who has refined, you know, your game and and all the fish that you know how to catch, when and where. But let's go back a little bit to Maine. Uh, you say you cut your your teeth on trout in Maine. Uh, how, how old were you? Uh, I was just still in high school. Just out, you know, to, uh, yep, I was still in high school. And it was totally by accident. I kept having these guys. I had moved there from New Jersey, and in a year or two, I had a reputation of being effective and fanatical. And I kept having these guys asking me to take them, take them fishing. And I saw no reason to do that. There, it just didn't make sense to me. Why would I take you guys fishing with me? And there was one gentleman that was being relentlessly 
dogged me about taking them fishing. And just off the cuff one day, I said, I will take you fishing, but it'll cost you $100, thinking that that would f- finalize the problem and run him off. And he had his money out of his pocket before I could say, no, 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 $200. And that's where the whole guiding thing just blossomed from there. And how old were you at that time? I think I was just barely 18. Right. So that's when you knew this was going to be a future for you. I, I knew that, that it was a possibility. It was probably another half dozen years before I started focusing it on as a, a serious career. So that was when you were 18, you were still up in Maine. When did you gravitate to the Keys? Or not to the Keys, the very next to year, South Florida. I, the very next year, I got a waiter's job at the uh, Ocean Reef Club and spent two winters working for them and working nights waiting on tables and whatever else. And then at, during the day, uh, fishing a lot and doing a very small amount of guiding because I wasn't licensed. But this, again, back into the situation of people hearing about the fishing that I was doing and wanting me to take them. Right. And they, uh, that's when the whole got really serious about the saltwater guiding. And what year was this? That would have been 81. So you've been down here 40 years doing this. Uh, I moved permanent to Palm Beach in 87. Right. Um, you were at Ocean Reef I, there I, for a few years. Well, it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't constant. I was there in the winter times, and then I was back in New England in the summers. So I, uh, the, there was a little bit of snowbirdism going on until about 88, and then there was here. And when moved to, uh, to Palm Beach, I had been exposed to offshore fishing down in the Keys, had an opportunity to go fishing offshore one day. And that very first day, caught black fins, kings, and dolphin. And flats fishing was all over for me at that point. It was like, this is the stuff. And and you were doing some flat fishing just prior to going offshore. Oh, when I, before the offshore trip, uh, I was all flats fishing. It was all bone fishing, permit, and tarpon. And I didn't know anything else. You know, the, uh, the amount of literature at that point of guys fly fishing offshore for pelagic species was almost non-existent. I mean, there were a couple of books out, but as far as a real interest and a real activity level with fly fishermen doing it, it was almost non-existent at that point. So how did you figure out how to tie these flies and what flies would work with what species? Because you're talking, you know, you chase over 40 some different species up there. Uh, well, that was a, uh, that, that was a long progression. Those things didn't happen overnight. Um, the, the, the first half dozen years of being a serious offshore guide with fly there was a lot of learning, a lot of learning going on. There was a lot of rod breaking going on. The, the, uh, <laughs> we, were, we were breaking dozens and dozens of rods those first couple of years. I, I was ineffective ex- at explaining to clients how a fish straight down is not something that you want to lift your rod over your head, you know, pulling up on. And uh, there, was, there was a pretty good learning curve on my part and on the client's part. Tell me about those first years up in, in up in Palm Beach. What were you seeing up there, and 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 how did you end up in Palm Beach? Uh, I went looking specifically for a place that had a good inshore fishery for poor weather options and the shortest run possible to offshore. Um, I had I had a couple of opportunities to go to offshore destinations, and the one immediate apparent fact is that the farther it is out, the less you're going to be able to do it because of the weather allowing you to go or not. Um, and I found Palm Beach. I was looking at the topographical maps and said, hey, you know, it gets deep fast here. And I uh, started reading about the the fishing reports in the area, and it sounded like it would fill the bill nicely. And I uh, couldn't get there fast enough. Were there a number of other boats doing the same as you? Oh, but, no. But no. with bait? You oh, yeah, there's one. light tackle bait guys up there. Because sure. I know Butch Constable and, and Dickie Dickinson. Yep. Yep. How many others are there? Are there quite a few? You mean the do fly or that, that just do light like tackle? Your, that do that kind of like you do, you know, light tackle, oh. it, you know, close to the beach stuff, a little bit offshore. Uh, there are quite a few light tackle guys. Um, I'd say they're probably in the Palm Beach and Jupiter area. There's probably... I don't know, ten to fifteen guys that that do both, right? Um, but that's not many. No, not many compared to and, and they and pushing. they come and go. There's been the core, like you said, Butch and Dicky, um, Raymond Baird. Raymond Baird's just turned eighty, I think, and he's been guiding for fifty years there now. Wow! And if anybody ever wanted a historical 
you know, nice trip up the Loxahatchee River. The guy's just, he's been there forever. The things that he's seen change in the environment and the fishery is just, I can't, I have to feel bad for him because he's, you know, what we're seeing now on a pretty short term basis, right. he's been watching happen for 50 years. Right. Uh, but the, uh, the, there's, you know, it's nice that the number of guys working in the area, it's not jam packed like it is in the Keys. There, right. there isn't a guide every 50 feet. Um, there's a core of group guys that are really insistent about making it work for them. Uh, there's another uh, orbital bunch of guys that come and go every year, you know, guys that hang up a shingle and think they're going to start making money hand over fist and they throw all their money into the business and then realize that they don't get to use that black pen anytime soon. The red pen gets used a lot for the first <laughs> couple of years. Right. And you need the staying power and a nest egg to make get you through the first, you know, four, I think it was five, a good five years before I could really depend on the business up there. What did you, how did you innovate what you did? How did you find the wrecks, the bottom, you know, rock piles? How did you find the certain fish that you wanted to target without having ever done this before? Uh, the, well, you know, the, the wrecks are pretty well known. They've got charts. They've got, you know, fishing maps, top shot maps, or I forget what they're called. But um, they're they're pretty active in keeping the uh, um, structure uh, well advertised or not. Uh, at least known but back in the 80s they, they had that 87 oh, yeah. before gps yeah that was that's probably the the hey the uh the time where i really started concentrating on doing bottom stuff because of gps and being able to find effectively bottom structure before that uh, i was doing a little bit of it but it was all running on a heading watching your watch and you know your speed and trying to trying to find uh, i mean i never worked with loran so i didn't know what that was all about so it was actual, you know, trying to track down locations the old-fashioned way, and it wasn't that much fun, so I <laughs> didn't do a lot of it. I bet it was uh, the success rate might have been uh, marginal. Uh, once you got on, well, back in those days, actually, you didn't need to be on a wreck or a structure. The, the reef edge between uh, the farthest south I would go is probably Boca, and the farthest north I would go would probably be Jupiter Inlet. And that area where the reef is is such a narrow strip that it was at that time very well populated. At almost any given time, you could go out and just get on the reef edge and start drifting and run into kings and bonitas. And, uh, you know, you'd have to watch this time of year for the dolphin to be around or the cobia to be around or amberjacks or all those other things that are seasonal and come and go. Um, but the the reef was so pristine and full of life that was probably one of the one of the easy benefits of of doing it somewhat blindly back then. Mm -hmm. He had so many fish. If you had a decent looking fly, you could get it out of the boat. You ended up with a fish. You gotta catch something. What's that reef like now? Well, sadly, our state is full of people now, and I mean absolutely full. And the whole fishery is not able to deal with the amount of fishing pressure that's on it now it uh it is obvious that uh, yeah, there is just too many people uh just hammering away at it and on a daily basis and the fishing has been significantly impacted um the king mackerel nothing like what it used to be guys, guys who used to fish off palm beach and jupiter Back in the, even as recently as the early 80s, wouldn't put, if they were going out after sailfish, they wouldn't dare put a, fish, a bait in the water until they were in 200 feet of water because the kingfish would just eat them alive. You know, it's, and there's a lot of those kind of things that have changed. Um, at least uh, the one of the comeback stories is Spanish mackerel. I remember when they were still putting out the spotter planes and putting big nets around the schools of uh, Spanish mackerel and Spanish mackerel exploded blossomed right after the the net ban and right. i had never seen spanish mackerel south of uh palm beach before and i was seeing them all the way down the beach into boca and uh, that was one of the one of the success stories with one species with with the net ban and it helped the mullet too as well right it, it helped them all for a while um there are issues going on with the mullet now uh overfishing the the row mullet uh commercial fishing um and loss of habitat uh there's a there's quite a few things going on i'm not as ingrained into what the story with what's going on with the mullet as some of the people are 
Um, I I'll hear about it, but I'm not really sure of all the facets that have impacted that fishing. But that I remember when mullet schools during the mullet run wouldn't be a hundred yards long, long, they'd be a half mile long and a hundred yards wide mm-hmm. and solid black and not just one or two of these schools moving up the beach. It would be, you know, 20 miles of coastline with massive schools of mullet all up and down it. And piles of tarpon and sharks. And, and everything. everything. I mean, inside. I've seen sailfish in on five feet of water chasing mullet around. I've seen wahoo skyrocketing on mullet, you know, in 15 feet of water. Uh, and they, uh, the mullet schools are nothing like what it used to be, even in my short amount of experience time there. I remember when I was first getting involved with this world in Boca in fly fishing down here, the Keys, and up here in the fall, in the fall mullet run, and going out there and netting some mullet and trying to catch tarpon in the, in the mullet schools and watching the spray and seeing these tarpon slide like big silver blades, you know, uh, of steel on their side sliding through those mullet schools. I think that was some of the most fun I've ever had. Just and, seeing that. Oh my God. The, that it is a spectacle that everybody should see. I mean, it is the coolest thing with the spinner sharks and, you know, waves of jacks crashing through the, th- I mean, it was easily one of the most spectacular things in nature that Florida has to offer. I mean, it's yeah, just no a doubt. cool thing. Is it still pretty good like that in the fall? Oh, it's just, it, it's like that when you can get near the, the what mullet schools are left right um but i have never found that to be a good fishing opportunity oh no There's it's a good visual food yes i mean it's a really cool thing to go you know, see that time of year i have clients well i'll say well, we're going to go see a show and then you know everybody get it, and they'll be like so should we fish here i say absolutely not there's too much <laughs> damn food well <laughs> i remember we used to be more successful if we would take our mullet and troll on the outside of the schools where there are no... Or other, sink them other, dead on the bottom underneath the schools. Right. You know, yeah, absolutely. Make it stand out. I've had a limited amount of success doing that with flies and exactly the same kind of thought. Make a fly that stands out and fish it under the schools or on the edges. But really? It's still, You've caught them on fly uh, in those situations. Um, I've caught all of the species that we were just talking about, the spinner sharks and the tarpon and the snook and the, you know, all, but not in the numbers when you know the numbers of fish that are there, the numbers that you're actually hooking. It, you can find better stuff to do than that if your objective is to actually stick a hook in something. There's just too much food to compete with. Yeah, no doubt. Um, when, I mean, when did you just, did you ever, were you ever like a bait guy that, that like to throw or get absolutely i've done pretty much everything um but the uh, the fly fishing is the only thing that's kept my interest my fascination the whole way right i mean i i remember the first time i saw a tarpon bite a mullet that's like one of the greatest bombs kaboom that go off in, in the world of fishing yes and usually they miss it and they you get another bounce you know and then you you see the tar- the mullet going flying through the air, and then and the fish is going in the, the other direction. I actually have a great story about something like that. I had a couple of buddies of mine that talked me into going out and throwing mullet at the at the uh, at the tarpon during the mullet run, and they uh, <clears throat> we were fishing the edges. Actually, we were pretty far from any schools, but the tarpon were cruising back and forth between the schools, and these guys would put their mullet out, and the tarpon would come by, and one would possibly take some interest in it up and come up and take a swing at it and the mullet would run away and the thing would try to eat it again and the mullet would run away and the fish would lose interest and swim off. So I kind of poached their fish out from under them. I would wait until the tarpon was coming up after the mullet and then th- just throw a big black mullet fly in and let it sit right in their face. And I caught numbers of fish doing really? that. Yes, using a using a mullet as a, as a, uh, as a teaser. Um, I would do that with clients. It worked very well, but uh, there, there's, there, there, there's some tough fishing to be done. The mullet run thing is it, spectacular. It's cool to see. Go fish somewhere else. Yeah, um, that yeah. time of year, especially the fall, the mahi fishing and the skipjack tuna fishing can be really good off of Palm Beach, and that's typically what I'm doing. <coughs> do you have a, Do you have a favorite fish that you've chased over the years? Oh, dolphin is not even. Don't even have to think about it. Dolphin are my favorite things to fish. Really? For. Oh, absolutely. And why is that? Well, all fish have got a fighting style, like tunas and big jacks hit and go down and out. Um, mackerels uh, will hit and just streak in a straight line running. Uh, sailfish, tarpon, hit the fly, jump, change direction, jump, t- you know, all over the place. 
Um, a dolphin is the only thing I know that has all the fighting styles. And you have just as much of a likelihood of sticking a 20-pounder and having a greyhound the next 200 yards out of sight as it going straight down 200 feet and laying on its side and fighting you like a tuna for the next 45 minutes. You never really know what's going to happen when you stick a dolphin. You know, it's, they're just all over the place as far as their fighting styles and techniques. Not to mention their color. The color, the way they taste. Um, they're a nice fish for fly rod fishing because they don't tire themselves out to the point of being unrecoverable. You right. know, you can't release them. You know, they, they won't fight themselves quite to that point. Um, so catch and release, and I may be the one of the only nut cases around that release 20 pound dolphin. I like those being back out there in the gene pool. Um, and but I think also too the dolphin around here are not big enough that they you have to fight them for very long because you're going to catch them a little bit quicker than you will a really big fish that might take a while. Boat record's 49 pounds around here for me. But how long ago? Uh, that was uh, probably 2010. Wow. Now, I, I absolutely that agree that the dolphin fishing in the past four years has just plummeted. It's nothing like what it used to be. But they, uh, there, there used to be, the biggest one I ever saw out there came in an eight, three, 20 inch dolphin that were hooked up all at the same time. Just bam, 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 came in, ate all three of them. And now all three of my guys are following this 80 pound plus fish. 80 pound dolphin. Yeah, every bit of it. Uh, Holy now they're cow. all following this this fish around the boat. Were there any bounces? Did he jump at all? He went straight to the motors and took a lap around the motors and broke all three lines off and swam <laughs> off into the distance. He was not only big, he was really smart. That was just one of the most incredible experiences I've ever seen a dolphin pull off. It was just really, we all just looked at each other and was, oh, what the hell just happened? It all happened in about 30 seconds. Have you ever seen any blue marlin out there? I used to see a lot more, a lot more. And up until, I'm not sure what year, it's probably just about the time the sharks started getting bad. So probably 2011, 2012. Before that, every year since I started during fall albacore season, we would have encounters two or three a summer of the marlin coming and eating the the uh, fall albacore that somebody was fighting. Wow. Yeah. But, they, uh, but not... I have heard of actually a couple of guys fishing for them and get and getting them hooked up recently. So there's still a few out there. I, I find that hard to believe where you're actually targeting blue marlin fishing for them, as you just mentioned, and being successful because there's so few around, right? There are just not that many around. Are they? Is but it a, is there's it a, only they're about the only ones. The guys that are fishing for them are hooking up 10, 12 pound false albacore and bridle rigging them. And towing them out into four, five, six hundred feet of water. Right. And if as long as they don't encounter sharks, the only thing out there else that's going to eat of a false albacore that size is going to be the guy in the blue suit. Right. Right. Do you, how often do you target sailfish out there? Not as much as I used to. Yeah. Uh, that we used to we used to do a lot better on them. It's it's you know. I mean, I would think that uh, because that is a bait and switch game. It is. And it's a lot of fun, and, it, and it's really one of the few things that really get my knees knocking, you know, when we're doing it, and it's really happening. But the numbers of those fish have gone down. The fishing pressure on them has at least quadrupled in the past 10 years. Back in the 90s, if we decided we wanted to try that during the sailfish season in the winter and we had the weather, we would get, we would get shots. We wouldn't always get hits, but we would always have fish coming up on the teasers. And now they've been educated to the point where it's really hard to get a sailfish that ramped up to chase a teaser all the way back up to the boat and then hit a fly. Right. Uh, the past few times I've tried, we've had some window shoppers and, you know, you see them <clears throat> briefly right there next to the teaser. One might take a whack at it, but they don't commit. They don't stay on the teaser and they don't come into the boat as well as they used to. And also the, uh, the Atlantic sailfish is so much different than the Pacific. <coughs> I've never had an opportunity to do Pacifics. Yeah. Um, I know that they'll tend to stay on the teaser a lot yeah, it, longer. It, they're just so much easier. Yeah. yeah. Well, the place where they do them, they're two-year-old fish that have never seen a hook before. I would yeah. like to find a place like that with the Atlantic sailfish. Right. But I don't know if such a place exists. How much damage, if that's the correct word to use, that the tournaments in Palm Beach are putting on the sailfish? Or the, that 
pressure and all those boats out there every day? Uh, well, I know that the, recently, since the since the time that we used to do well on them, any time during the season, I'm now down to about a four to six week uh, a, a window of opportunity when, depending on what the weather does, if it gets cold early in late October or November, we start seeing sailfish. From there until the, the tournament start is my window, and I can possibly get some 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 damage done or as some a uh, good results dragon teasers for sailfish up until the sailfish tournament start after that those fish have all been very well educated now let me ask you <coughs> let me ask you since you know i'm i don't know anything about that sailfish game are these fish we did that well, we, yeah, but that doesn't mean I know anything about it. <laughs> but we didn't see anything. It's not that complicated. Put something <laughs> well, in the water, drag it around until a sailfish quacks at it, and then throw something that kind of looks like it. Well, I guess my question is, do this are these resident fish that kind of hang around because you say mm -hmm. that they get really educated and smart? Don't they just keep swimming through, and we have new waves of fish consistently throughout the winter? I don't believe so. I believe that they move in mass sort of right um they're all looking for temperature you know preference they're looking for bait supply um and uh i think the i don't believe unless it's weather causing drastically changing weather uh would probably send in more and different fish right but once the weather settled down the fish that have moved in are the are the ones you got pretty much i think i'm not i'm not really that much up on on sailfish movements there there are a couple of guys that are really smart about that right. and have really researched it well um but i don't believe and, and the numbers are just still again another fish species that the numbers are nothing like what they used to be the West Palm Beach Fishing Club in 2005, I think it was, their silver sail, uh, sailfish tournament, 1,000 fish in three days. And that was a record until very recently, and I believe it was the Pirates Cove uh, tournament. Uh, Stewart broke that um, uh, just a year or two ago. So uh, I, so it, it probably just fluctuates like most years. Some years are better than others, or do you think the uh, the numbers are? I'm pretty sure that most of the sail fishing is driven by weather. Right. It, the, well, the weather drives the bait fish, concentrates the bait fish, changes the water temperatures that they're looking for, and that's what causes them to pile up in any given right. location. I've always heard, you know, the north wind and with the Gulf Stream heading north, that sounds like a big chum day for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I get so aggravated. How, how, well, you know, that one of the, during that Silver Sailfish Derby, the top day, and I know it was 1,000 fish for, this, for the whole tournament, but I believe their top day was something ridiculous, like 600 fish was a flat, calm day. Wow. Yeah. The the fish were all in one spot and everybody got there and just it was game on and guys were trolling six line spreads and cooking six fish at a time and you know pitching out baits on the following fish. It was just Miracle, mayhem. Miracles do happen. Yes. Well, I always know have known you as a shark guy, you know, the spinner sharks on the beaches up there. I seem to go through phases where I'm known as the Bonita guy and then the dolphin guy and then so the shark guy. So it's a seasonal guy. thing then, uh, right? Well, it seems to cover more time than that, but yeah, lately uh, I've been known as the the shark guy, which is kind of funny to me because the shark fishing is again another thing that that all those fish have decided that they like the Fort Pierce and North area, and they haven't been coming down to Palm Beach in the numbers like they used to. You know, you'd see the aerial footage that the news choppers, oh, the shark migration is, you know, here. is, is happening, and they're following the bait fish, which another thing I found hysterical is there's no bait fish anywhere near those fish at all. They were just moving down the beach. Do you th it, but tell me about the first time you had my got connected had, with this had my sharky. ass handed to me by <laughs> yeah. an unknown thing that i was yeah. i had no idea what was happening i ended up hooking one and i don't even think i was trying for one i may have just been in kind of shallow and and what did you see that day i saw a really strong fish that they uh absolutely annihilated a fly like it had offended their heritage and then dumped 300 yards a line and started jumping you know, almost out of sight. It was it was a spectacular and awe inspiring, and I uh, 
that was, you know, I need to figure these things out. It was tough to begin with. You know, traditional flies, they have nothing to do with those. You know, traditional okay. colors, they have nothing to do with that. You know, the orange and black uh, were a, uh, suggestions by some other guys, some old guys, that they actually, I think Mark Sosin may have took a, uh, suggested black to me for the for the sharks. Um, but they, uh, they were, that was a big learning curve on those things, too. And the, the equipment, because you couldn't fish for them with 20-pound leaders. Right. I mean, you could if you wanted to feed every fly you, you, in right. your box to them because they wrap up in the leader and it's over. Um, and, you know, figuring out what the leader and the bite tippet and, and what kind of fly lines to use and, you know, all of that was a, uh, was a pretty steep learning curve. I never would have imagined that I would need a 14 weight on a regular basis, right. you know, for a fish that's less than a hundred pounds. So, so initially you were just free casting to these spinner sharks. Um, well, you, you can do that in certain situations when they're, when it's glassy calm and they're all up tight to the beach, you can fish those just like tarpon. You know, mm. get in front of them and get the fly in the water and let them come up to the fly. Um, and that can work very well on these really glassy, calm days when they're only, I mean, spinning distance from dry sand. Um, and you can't get a, a chum trail or a scent trail into their area for them to follow. That's probably your best recourse is to just free throw at them. And so you can probably uh, effectively fish for them off the beach. If you like to run, yes, <laughs> you're going to need to run or have just a pile of line, oh, you know, right. have a Pacific, Tibor Pacific on your reel. But they, uh, you'll, it, the, that's one of the interesting things I've found. I don't know what your experience with them, that if you hook 10 of those things, whether you're 50 feet or 500 yards from the beach, nine out of 10 of them are going to run straight at the beach when you hook them. Right. You know, I think that's their safety zone. They like being in shallow. They like being in close to the, the, uh, the, the beach. And they, uh, I've always been impressed with, you know, just straight as an arrow, right? Straight at the beach. I remember. All those bathers out of the way. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> I was just going to mention that. If, uh, it was probably four or five years ago. Um, you know, with Power Pro and a spinning rod, um, we weren't fly fishing that day. And uh, fishing with a balloon, somebody was on my boat that didn't know how to throw the fly. And I said, let's just go catch some, you know, put a balloon out in a, in a, uh, in a jackhead or, uh, you know, a bluefish or whatever. And we hook up this fish and, and this probably 90-pound spinner shark is in about two feet of water and going directly north. And you got this French guy with his weenie whopper out there in about, you know, eight feet of water. And I'm thinking, this power pro is going to cut this guy in I'm half. half right? <laughs> and, and I'm screaming, I'm screaming. And, you know, that that's not going to work. I'm ready to cut the power pro. And thank God that the shark, you know, came offshore a little bit. We'd have to worry about, you know. I've clotheslined two jet skiers now. They uh, refuse to, they're looking straight at me. And I'm waving at them like a madman. And they just run right straight into the backing on a fish that's been stretched out about 200 yards, and the backing hits them just chest or neck level and no snatches kidding. them right. On. Well, you've got 80 pound what leader, kind? you know, and you've got 50 pound, you know, sure. You know, it's backing. not going to break. <laughs> well, it will at some point, but not before they're not bleeding, you know. <laughs> what kind of a damage was done? Uh, one guy see. was a pretty much unscathed. He let go of the jet ski at the. Probably the life intelligent jacket or something. time, right? Uh, the other guy did get cut pretty badly on the backing, but that's you know that's why I don't use Power Pro on the fly right. reels. That's just asking for damage, right? Um, I've always loved those sharks because working with Hardy, those are the fish that I was catching to to really test the product the durability they're a great fish to do testing on because if i go tarpon fishing you know testing a tarpon rod you're lucky to catch one a day exactly uh, but these sharks you can chum them up and throw flies and really hook a bunch of fish um and that's why i've always enjoyed them so much but you know the well, west I remember you call used to call them tarpon that eat <laughs> <laughs> yeah no they do eat you know um how often do you see these hammerheads uh, feeding on these these spinner sharks? The old pattern used to be that the hammerheads would show up about two thirds of the way through the season. Now, it used to be before the two thousand and five hurricanes, Francis and Jean. Since I started working in nineteen ninety in Palm Beach, those spinner sharks would show up between Christmas Day and New Year's Day every year, 
they were the most punctual thing I had ever heard of in saltwater. That you could, I mean, guaranteed go out on New Year's Day and find spinner sharks. Um, and typically they would leave pretty close to the end of March. So you got a three month window, three month season. And typically you would not see the, the hammerheads in the schools until about the beginning of March. But now it seems like anytime you find a group of them anywhere, anytime, the hammerheads are not far away. And the bulls now uh, have lost a couple of the bull sharks now um, coming into the spinner shark schools. And that's really aggravating. I mean, it's one, you know, you go through life and you have these snapshots in your mind of things, the really cool things that you've seen. And the one, one of the things in my mind is this every bit of 15 foot hammerhead completely clear of the water in a vertical position and an 80 pound spinner shark in its mouth came up and annihilated a spinner shark in 15 feet of water right next to the boat one day. It was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It's obviously the, the land of the fast and the dead. We had a, uh, a spinner shark on the boat, or actually on, on my fly, we we're about ready to take the fly out of it, and this big hammerhead came under the boat and grabbed this spinner shark, and swam around with this 90-pound fish sideways in its mouth for about 10 minutes, and pretty soon I'm looking down at my trolling motor, I'm staying with this, this hammerhead. Again, it's enormously long. Are you still attached to the spinner still shark big, at this still, point? Yeah, I'm still attached. Pretty soon the spinner shark is gone. And now I've got this hammerhead on the end of my, my rig. I don't was that, know. Was that the day that we were filming yes. for Hardy? Yeah, yeah, I was the camera boy. Yeah, yeah, you were right next to us. I mean, and we watched you for uh, about a half an hour, and I told the camera guy, you know, we can go away now and <laughs> come back in 45 minutes. It's going to look just like this. Well, let's go Let's go catch some fish. <laughs> you know, and, and interesting, interestingly enough that I don't know how my fly got into the hammerhead without, you know, going from the spinner shark to the hammerhead. I don't know if it was in its stomach, you know, or it just came loose and it had the hammerhead in its mouth. But long story short, I broke the fly line 40 minutes later. Right. But uh, I've always found that. I remember that. that. It was a 12-foot foot plus uh, hammerhead. Oh, it was enormous, enormous. Um, what is, but I've seen in the past where I think hypothetically they were chasing colder water. Were they coming down with bait? What was what was actually bringing these sharks down to the Palm Beach area? It was because water now... temperature, and it was colder water temperature so that we get now. Right. Um, uh, there's a gentleman um, that runs a research uh, for the uh, for FAU. He's been running a program on uh, studying the spinner sharks now for ten years. I don't. I, he's been doing it for a long time. And in speaking to him, he says that their movements are all driven by water temperatures. And not bait. No, not bait. Those congregations are breeding congregations or some kind of mating behavior con mm -hmm. uh, congregations. Um, and that's the multiple mass jumping, you know, if you see them, I call them. Spinning. I call them having a jump off where they're all, you know, you've got a school of, you know, a couple hundred sharks and they're all in the air. You know, there's a couple in the air the whole time. You know, um, I call that them having a jump off, and that's some kind of mating behavior. Because uh, otherwise, at different times of year, they don't do that. Uh, pretty, not I'm, the mass I'm jumping. Presuming. They do use that as a feeding technique. If you see, oh, well, there's a couple of reasons that I've noticed <clears> that the, you'll, if you see a spinner shark that just comes out of the water by himself, and you haven't seen one, you know, anytime recently or see one anytime soon thereafter. If you look close, when those things come blasting out of the water spinning, quite often you'll see about a six to eight inch long remora fly off of them. And I think those remoras get up in their gills and nibble on their gills and it bugs them. So they'll get rid of the remoras by coming up, jumping, and spinning. The other time that I see them jumping, and you'll see one jumping or see several jumping in the same area repeatedly, a lot of times I've gotten into that area, and there's a school of bait fish, blue runners, ballyhoo, you know, any number of other kinds of bait fish, and they're ripping up through these schools trying to stun them and then coming back to pick up the pieces. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that I can figure out when you've got, you know, 20 sharks in the air at all times for 30 minutes, it's got to be some kind of mating behavior. What What are you seeing right now with with bull sharks and sharks in general? I know up and down... The keys. Oh, I, I it, hear the troubles that were all the the fishermen, the guides, and the anglers are seeing with, with big sharks. Well, 
uh, that goes all the way from what I understand from Key West to Hatteras that, you know, all the major sport fishing uh, destinations have huge shark problems that the populations of not just bulls, but uh, sandbars, which are protected. You can't, you can't even fish for sandbars or can't keep them. You can keep bulls. Uh, and duskies, we said we had two or three duskies hanging around the boat today, hammerheads, tigers, um, black tips, spinners. I mean, we, all of them, lemons, everything, uh, the population's exploding. Um, and sadly at the same time, the really big schooling fish, the mullet, mackerel, jacks, bluefish have all been just blasted, decimated by commercial fishing. So you got a food supply going down and a, and a predatory base, uh, population going up and they're going to group up around the last big food sources and for us that manifests itself into the reef fishing and any other kind of schooling fishing the king mackerel the the tuna the blackfin tuna schools and the uh, false albacore schools and that's been going on for a little while and it, it's definitely getting worse every year but before i think it was the winter before last at the end of the false albacore season the sharks would follow the false albacore out of the area and you would be fine through the winter. You wouldn't have shark problems. Now the sharks just, when the f false albacore leave, the sharks just say, okay, we'll see you next year. We'll just hang out here and eat everything else. And now there's, it's really rare. If you have a fish that pulls drag anywhere near the reef, uh, you won't get that fish to the boat. I mean, it's just, it is a brutal attack every day that the sharks just zero in on the boats and then generally won't let you have anything at all of any size. Do you think it may be, I hate to use the term unethical as a guide to take people and fish off of the reefs where they know anything of size is going to get eaten by a shark? Well, some of the guys, well, the, uh, I think most of the responsible guys have upped their tackle sizes. You know, they're not using the rods that they would normally. They're using stuff that the customers can really pull on a fish with without breaking the equipment and getting the fish to the boat. They're still losing fish to sharks. But I know what you mean. Right. I won't fish in a lot of spots now because my fly guys, they have trouble getting fish to the boat in a hurry. Um, I don't fish for the cobias that come into follow, following the bull sharks anymore during the summer. Uh, there's, there's no point to it. There's a trick to getting those things actually, but I haven't been able to instill that trick into anybody and just which, yet. What's that trick? Uh, well, and, and the weird thing is that before six, seven years ago, I'd never lost a cobia to a shark. The sharks just don't pay any attention to them. Nobody that I knew had ever lost cobias to the shark. And then in the space of one year, it was boom, they're on the menu and the sharks, you hook a cobia, the shark turn around, spin around and just grab it immediately. So the only way I've been able to manage during that summer season when the cobias are following the bull sharks around the false albacore schools and you get a shot at a cobia, um, you want to do it with a fairly large rod and you get the cobia to eat the fly and then just as quickly as you can hammer the hook in and then put the reel in free spool. And what generally happens is that if there's no pressure on the cobia, he may run a little bit but then he'll stop running. He'll just sit there and shake his head a little bit, trying to get rid of the fly. And as long as he's not running and thrashing, the sharks won't pay any attention to him. And you're really just kind of trying to fool him. You're just really easy lifting and just kind of trying to fool him into coming back up close enough to the boat to get him, to stick a gaff in him and throw him in the boat. The drawback to that is that you've got a completely green cobia that you've just put in the <laughs> boat and is not going to beat the hell out of everything that isn't tied down. So it, it's a it's kind of a tricky technique. It works pretty well. I got two two last year um, uh, on one, on one day, one occasion, uh, both about forty pound fish right out of the middle of five, you know, fifteen twenty big bull sharks all looking to kill something. Um, it it, they, uh, it there's there's probably some other techniques, uh, but they, uh, with the fly rods it's tough. Um, you know, you and I can do stuff, but they. Uh, People that have never done it before, walking them through it is tricky. Right. What? Um, how do you catch kingfish without any sort of a bait and switch scenario? 
I tried chum in those, and most of the time off Palm Beach, it's always a school of, of a, 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 of a uh, not a school, but a fleet of a uh, kingfish uh, boats. And chumming them up to the surface like it can be done down off the Keys does not happen very often when you've got that kind of traffic on the surface above them. Right. Um, the other issue was that if I was really trying to target just kingfish, uh, throwing chum would bring in everything else as well, and you can't get past the blue runners and the rainbow runners and the false albacore and everything else if you really just want to get kingfish. And since they're deep holding fish most of the time, anyhow, just going with sinking lines and big streamers works extremely well. Just not even chumming, just throw that and nope. let it sink down there. Get it down as deep as you can reach or as deep as you think the fish are. And then, uh, and it doesn't need to be a blinding fast strip. In fact, quite often, just a good one single quick strip and then a one 1,000, two 1,000 pause and one more single good quick strip. And that, that is probably one of the most effective ways for King Mackerel. That's, they love that retrieve. Hmm. And they hit on the pause. On the drop, uh, when you're pausing between between strips, that's so the, that's when the fly you, still stays horizontal in the yeah. water calm. It I, won't sink at all. I can I kind of watch it happen. I've seen you know, it's not just one fish lining up on it. There's a half a dozen fish that are following this thing, and they kind of goad each other into finally somebody you know one somebody's going to whack at it, and a uh, and it works extremely well. What uh, right now? You we were speaking about about b- the ability or inability to find bait, and about maybe fishing next year further north. What is your the, the fishing conditions like for you now? Being able to fish how you used to over the last thirty five years. I'm bringing back the first six or eight years that I worked. I was still in a real fly minded mindset. I used no chum the first couple of years that. I, I've worked and fished here um, and worked out techniques like the sinking line for the for the uh, for the kings, dragging teasers for dolphin and tunas, um, work out ways of working without chum. Right. And today specifically, we caught eight different species of fish. We didn't have a scrap of chum in the boat. Hmm. So um, you don't you don't. Uh, I'm going to go back bait. to old school and start fishing without. Oh, I would like to. I have. I I usually. A lot of my clients are very used to me having a live well full of pilchards and being able to fire the fish up, but the pilchards aren't there. You know, the, the there is no bait right now in Palm Beach Inlet, or Palm Beach in the Lake Worth Lagoon up at the north end. There is no bait. Is that just a seasonal thing? No, no. Something's wrong. Something's happened. Something's been done. I don't know what exactly what it is. I have some suspicions. I think that there's been some commercial acquirement of bait that has been unregulated and has gotten to the point of being completely wiping out the food supply in the Lake Worth Lagoon, which will explain why the tarpon fishing and the snook fishing and the jacks and everything else that you should be catching there year round has just plummeted. This past winter, I caught zero bluefish, zero ladyfish, and zero Spanish mackerel in the Lake Worth Lagoon this past winter. And before it was always pretty solid. Every winter. They were there. They were there to, for the taking or the catching. Uh, and something's changed. The, uh, the, the water quality is one thing that you can attribute it to. The, the dying off the grass beds is another thing. But when you remove the food, that's when it all comes crashing down. And right. the food's gone. Um, I may not even try to find bait anymore after the past two weeks that I've been looking. And you think it might be proactively removed through commercial fishermen or? I know that, that there is uh, false albacores, one, uh, menhaden, pilchard, sardines, glass minnows are all on an unregulated species list that there is no bag limit. There is no uh, uh, oversight of it. And if you have a commercial license to collect it, you can sink your boat with it. Um, and a lot of guys, because of the drop in the other kinds of fishing, have turned to this as a ways of making a living. That they uh, they can't catch enough kingfish, they can't catch enough snapper, dolphin, whatever, whatever they're used to fishing for. And a lot of them are turning to this as a resource. And there's too many boats doing it. And you see them. Oh yes. And how are they catching all these fish? Cast nets. Cast nets. Yes. Uh, two boats that took 
7,800 pounds of pilchards off of Peanut Island in two days. Good Lord. Yeah, and that they move it into an area and they don't stop until the bait's gone. There's no no restriction, no thinking about tomorrow at all. And it's a it's a mind boggling amount because mm-hmm. I've I've figured out if I have a thousand bait fish in my live well, that's a full live well. Right. Weighs twenty pounds. That's I use and they remove and on a heavy day of chumming, I use twenty pounds of bait fish. It and it's just thousands of pounds going. And it gets boxed up and sold as frozen bait. I can't imagine you not losing sleep at night. It's uh, It's been challenging. Well, because your targeted fish is, is leaving the premises. They're not even there. Exactly. And the, what's going to happen at this point is that as areas get wiped out, those guys are going to keep going further and further afield and... If they're not where you are now, if you've got a good bait supply wherever you are now, they will be there someday soon. And they'll be taking all the bait fish. It's maddening. It really is. It's such a short-sighted mindset that how is removing all the food not you know, making sense to you that that's not a good thing? Right. What kind of phone calls have you placed, if any? Just and, frustrating. And who ones. do you call? Uh, I've tried uh, contacting the Fish and Wildlife. Um, uh, I've tried talking to some people about it, and uh, and I'll blame myself. I, I've seen this trend started three, four, five years ago. It should have started right in on it then, right? Because I think it's past the tipping point now, and nothing can be done. I think. Uh, a lot of the bait fish are kind of like salmon. They go back to where they were spawned. If you remove an entire, you know, generation, that fish has to be reintroduced now. They won't come back on their own. Right. But that's that's uh, a- absolute speculation on my part. I'm just going by what I'm seeing. Right. Um, so I don't know. There, there. I think there are a lot of things that have gotten past the tipping point now. Um, I'm a little frustrated and discouraged about it, but. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe things will change around. But that's affected your winter fishing more than anything? Uh, it has. Uh, the, the Lake Worth Lagoon used to be a really nice, pristine body of water. Uh, I mean, I remember throwing, I, I would not go throw a cast net around Peanut, uh, Munion Island up around MacArthur Park because the grass beds were so lush, you would just fill your live well with grass. There, you couldn't go and throw a cast net on bait fish up there. Catch plenty of trout, reds. Mm-hmm. I mean, all that stuff used to be there, but um, it's it's not there anymore. The grass is gone. The grass is gone completely. I haven't seen a blade of turtle grass in Lake Worth Lagoon. There's some, uh, I think it's called patina grass. I'm not sure what it is. It's a thin, different kind of grass, mm-hmm. but turtle grass. I haven't seen turtle grass in six, seven years. The water issue. Yeah. Well, it seems yep. like, uh, you know, captains for clean water, you know, the people that are interested, you know, trying to, you know, oversee Lake Okeechobee and how they drain that stuff and they don't filter the water or allow that that water to be managed properly is really affecting a lot of areas. It is. It's affecting everywhere that that water goes. Right. And my hat's off to those guys because just this little bit of experience that I have working with this bait fish situation Moving at the speed of government is very aggravating. Right. And those guys are dealing with it on a daily basis. Right. Well, what's the good news out there? We just talked about the bad news. Well. What's the good news? uh, Caught some dolphin today. (laughs) I mean, that's, uh, I was delighted about that. I've had quite a few days recently looking and not finding anything. But other than the lagoon, your fishery is still pretty strong. You still, you're still catching No, I would say that there's been an impact on every species. Right. Um, if Florida's bad fishing is still better than a lot of good fishing everywhere else. Right. You know, it's going to take a lot to get to the point where everybody thinks it's bad fishing. It's just so we remember what it used to be like. Right. I, I've been down here for 40 years, uh, tarpon fishing, and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, this evolution, this change. Some days are magnificent. Some days are not so good. But I have to remind myself and pinch myself 
that what we are doing is really a special thing. We have a relationship with magnificent animals. Yes. And we don't have to be in their presence all day long to make a great day of it. It's a matter of getting in your boat and enjoying the adventure. And the journey as much as the reward of catching these fish. And I, I was going through a stage where I was aggravating myself expecting you know the the th- the days that i used to have on a regular basis and then i finally like almost had to self slap myself like get over it and realize what we do is really a special thing it is you know ab- you know bad fishing is not necessarily a bad thing because if it was always good i mean there are a couple of species that used to be written in stone the exact kind of day that you're going to have on a day by day by week by week by monthly basis and there were no surprises you would always have the exact same kind of fishing and it would get boring it would get just boring and you wouldn't want to go do it anymore so the bad days of fishing really is what makes the really good days nice and spicy and entertaining and something you look forward to so bad bad fishing isn't necessarily a bad thing right you know as far as the sport fishing world is concerned well, it's um, how have you adjusted your clientele to fly fishing only? Was that difficult? <clears throat> because I'm sure you have a lot of people that ha- only know how to how to do oh, the spin I've, and rod stuff. And no, actually, no. Everyone that's ever sought me out were fly fishermen. So you you don't have a lot of newbies. No, I get plenty of newbies. I would actually say. Uh, whether they know it or not, the majority of my guys are newbies. <laughs> they think they're they think they're good, <laughs> and you know you can be a really good trout fisherman. And when you step into salt water, you You're uh, a you you turn in your your card, and you have to start over again. It's a completely different world. Um, but they, uh, you know, th- that's going back to the you know the variety being the spice of life. You know, I. Uh, there's a lot of really mainstream overdone aspects of fly fishing that have just been done to death and no nobody's really entertained by it anymore so getting out of the you know out of the box out of the proverbial fly box and doing something different is what you need to do to keep it interesting but i but in the past i realized that sometimes people want to hook up to fish and if you're a newbie fly guy, it might be a little bit tougher than being able to, you know, apply a bait with a spinning rod. That might be almost impossible unless you know how to throw with a fly rod quite far. Uh, well, it depends on what you're trying to do with a fly rod. There are a lot of things that, like, for instance, the sinking line thing. Somebody who's never touched a fly rod before can catch fish immediately with a sinking line. And I am a proponent that if you want to have a friend, for instance or a family member, or somebody that you would like to see get interested in fly fishing, don't frustrate them with the casting aspect. If you've got an opportunity to take them out with a sinking line and get them catching fish immediately, their patience level for learning the casting is dramatically better. So quite often, I'll have fathers bring sons or daughters or whatever, and uh, they want to start with a casting lesson. Okay, we'll do the casting lesson. We do, you know, an hour-long casting lesson the first thing of the day. And then I tell them, okay, great. Now we're going to go catch fish the rest of the day, and you're not going to have to make a single cast. And teach them how to do the sink and line thing. And those people stick with it, and they have a better better patience level. You know, they know what the, the, the eventual outcome, you know, they already know what catching a fish is like, and that's what they're working towards. Right. Um, the, you know, I feel just horrible for the guys that have come from freshwater and the first thing that they want to go fish for is bonefish or permit or tarpon, you know, they're, you know, you're not ready for that level. It's going to be a frustrating experience for everybody involved. You know, take some time, get better with your casting fish for other species, you know, get practice on the other species, you know, and, uh, I'm pretty sure that there is not a small amount of guys that had the experience of, okay, I'm a good freshwater fisherman. I'm going to go down to wherever, you know, and fish for bonefish or whatever. And you know, the first day, the first typical day, you can't even see the fish. And then your window of opportunity is all five seconds long. And the guide's going 40 feet, 40 feet, you know, left now. Okay, never mind. Let's look for another one. <laughs> right. You know, and that goes on all day long as your first experience. And there's not a small mu- amount of the people that had that kind of experience that decided that's what all saltwater fly fishing is like. And they've walked away never to return. And there are 
I mean, how many hundreds of species of fish that'll eat a fly? And right. to expose yourself to a understandably frustrating experience on the first shot and to give up on it at that point, you know, there's a lot of fun you just you know walked away from. There's a lot more you know stuff that isn't demanding, stuff that stuff that's more demanding. Um, you know, there there the aspects of it are, are endless. Well, kudos to you that you stick with fly only. Well, I mean, like I said, I think that's just a testimony to stubbornness, really. I just <laughs> don't want to do anything else. And uh, yeah, I, I think the, the, you know, I've got the whole myriad of people that have never done it before have a great time doing it. Um, guys that have been doing it forever on the same thing over and over and over again get to do something completely different. And that not only revitalizes their interest in their normal kinds of fishing, but it opens up their mind to doing other kinds of fishing too. What was the diff- most difficult fly that you innovated to to catch your fish? Because, you know, when you first got started, it, there was not certain patterns for certain fish, if I'm not mistaken. No, it was pretty limited. Um, there, you know, Lefty's Deceiver, uh, Sarlma Mac, I think that was, I forget. I think there's a couple of guys who claim credit for that pattern. Um, you know, there it, it was it was pretty limited back in the eighties. Uh, the for uh, <clears throat> general purpose bait fish flies, right? Um, billfish flies. You know, Trey Coombs and 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 the uh, the guys that were going to South America for that kind of kind of developed all those flies together. And there, you know, a handful of the bonefish guys were were throwing out somewhat different kinds of flies. There were a lot of them that looked exactly alike that, you yeah. know, you re- a real de- defining line between patterns. But no, it was pretty limited. But that's one of the great things about the sport. And, you know, it's still a relatively lo- young sport. There is, you know, all the innovation, despite, you know, some some guys will tell you, oh, it's all been done before. You know, oh, oh that pattern's been around forever. I call BS on that. You know, and dare, and shame on them for telling somebody that thinks that they're being innovative. You know that you know there's no point trying. Right. You know, shame on them. That's you know just the fastest way to lose interest in everything. Right. And I've seen that happen at some of the big big shows. You know that they uh, somebody that shouldn't be talking that way was talking talking that way to somebody that was young and impressionable, and you know that's just wrong. You know right. the the sport is still basically wide open you know uh, it, you know the, the flats thing has been done a lot you know tarpon and permit bonefish it's been done a lot some of the shark fishing in the keys has been done a lot but the offshore stuff you know the, the you know wahoo tunas you know, you know all that stuff you know just scratching at the surface at this point right that's what's always been impressive to me about you and what you did up there you know, all fly and catching all these different fish, you know. I don't think it's a unique situation. That guys aren't doing this in the Keys blows me away. That bonefish lodges in the Bahamas that are on the shore within a half a mile of 3,000 feet of water aren't doing this blows me away. Do you think it's just because most people want to hunt their fish on the flats? I think they're scared to be experimental. I think people with fishing in specifically like their comfort zone. They've done something that's caught them fish once. They know techniques that work. They don't want to get out of that comfort zone. You know, go out and do something that you've never done before right. and see if it works. Well, why not? You know, why you know, are you in a hurry to go somewhere? You right. know, is the effectiveness on any, of any given day that crucial, you know? Do you think it's because of the client is demanding to be to be in fish and hooked up to fish? I'm not sure. I do know that, you know, well, I suspect that our given society now is a, I want immediate gratification right now. I don't want to work for anything right now. I want to have my enjoyment. I don't want anything, you know, uh, and fly fishing is a little bit contradictory to that kind of a mindset. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to experiment. And there's some days you're not going to get your gratification. Mm -hmm. But those days will make the days that you do get your gratification all that much more special. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Scott, it's a it's a it's a great conversation. Uh, I don't I don't think we've ever really covered your 
full spectrum like this before because usually we're in a hurry to. Well, you were asking go. me about flies. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you said which one was the, uh, the one. Um, yeah. The, which fly? Which fly do you most pride yourself in as far as the ones that are publicly known or the ones that have a uh, a certain amount of. Uh, you tell me. Secrecy to them. <laughs> you tell me. Uh, I. I uh, um, I call. I've got one. I call the Hamilton Special in in a uh, in in mixed company, and uh, it's called the Eat Me Streamer and company. That, you know, pretty well known around here. Anyhow, um, that that fly. The materials were the kink nylon materials, since that before those were available on the market back in the late '80s. Somebody handed me a handful of that stuff, and I would say it took a solid six months of prototypes of different different tying methods, different, you know, formations on the hook just to get it right where it looked good and it performed good and the fish liked it. And we, at that point, with that particular pattern, we started catching fish that we were catching uh, gag groupers and black groupers and spotted coronet fish and mutton snappers. I and mean, we were catching stuff that was so far out of the normal realm of fly catching that that's why we name it. it must be saying something to the fish. It's saying eat me to the fish. What so color is that fly? It, it's not a f- set color pattern or a size. It's a method of tying that gives you that broad uh, profile of a bait fish. Oh, interesting. And then you stick those stick the eyeballs on it, the the molded three D eyes on it. So the nylon material comes in everything from black to white and every color in between, and you can add. Uh, to any amount, either just a whisper of flash material to a full-blown coating of flash material in with the nylon material. The, the, the different aspects of what you can do with that pattern, uh, endless, absolutely endless. And a fish with everything from, from just a plain white to a plain black and everything in between. And there are certain places and times on certain species, and you need to be specific with the size, the color, the flash, the size of the eye. There was a time where we had a lot of small Spanish sardines, which compared to most of our bait fish around here, have an extremely tiny eye for their body size. I mean, it's just a really small eyeball compared to pilchards or thread fins. And there was a time where we were fishing blackfin and skipjack tuna, and they would refuse flies that had eyeballs too big. Wow. And literally had to change down the size of the eyeballs on the fly to finally figure out what it was. And we played with everything else first. I was just going to say, it probably took a while to figure out it was the eyeball. It was maddening to finally figure out that that's all it was, was the size of the eye. So that's just going back to one of the aspects that either really captivate a fly fisherman's imagination or really frustrates them is the real key is being... uh, you know, pay attention to detail. And if you pay close attention to detail, you will be successful at fly fishing. You know, and some of them are very small details. You, I'm sure you have a whole dictionary of real small, subtle things that make you such a, a successful tarpon fisherman. And it varies from fly to stripping, casting. Right. You know, leads. Yep. Certain fish. Timing, the speed they're traveling. Exactly right. Yep. How deep they are in the water. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you're not attentive to details like that, fly fishing is going to be a little bit of a frustrating thing for you. You're right. You know, if you're really uh, a success-minded person, if you're looking for success and you don't pay attention to the details, it's a tough Good sport. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you got a, a lot of roll heats on hand. <laughs> Well, Scott, thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, so it's, We've been trying know, to do this for a hell of a long time. I'm yeah, glad we finally yeah. You know, got, maybe got next year, next winter, you know, we can get together and fish again. We've been promising Absolutely. this for a while, but I've always enjoyed your company. I, I you turned I'm me on. More to a likely, great... I'm going to show up at your place in Colorado for some <laughs> trout fishing this summer. <laughs> yeah, trout's not bad. <laughs> yeah, I love trout. Yeah. Well, great to see you, and, uh, and like I said, you've been a great friend and a great inspiration to me and a bunch of well, my thank buddies you so much. The sharks nice. up there. It's been so much fun. Yeah, they're a hoot. Yeah. Well, thanks for you being who you are and your innovation and leading so many people to this great sport. Well, thank you. Thanks, Bob. When I saw its best life story, when I saw it's just a